Good afternoon. Today I'd like to talk briefly about all of the many choices we have when it comes to charting in JupyterLab. First, for a bit of context, what is visualization? Visualization is the art of turning raw data into pretty pictures. So by doing this, we try to use the human visual system to extract insight or knowledge from data, or at least that's a theory. In the context of data science and of Jupyter, the whole Jupyter ecosystem, this usually comes down to charting. But there is much more in the wonderful world that is visualization, and hopefully we'll get back to more of that in future lectures. For the purpose of this lecture, we focus on charting toolkits. So this is a, a figure from a talk given by Jake van der Plas at PyCon 2017. The talk was titled The Python Visualization Landscape. It perhaps could have been titled The Jupyter Visualization Landscape because most of the options that he talked about were actually uh, visualization and charting libraries that, uh, that are used in Jupyter. So the core question is with such a great number of plotting and charting toolkits for Jupyter, where should we invest our time? We have limited time. All of these various different toolkits have different strong points and uh, work better for different domains. But as practitioners, our time is limited, so we do have to make a choice. So for an, a normal, fortunately for normal data science and presentation purposes, there are currently two choices, none of which is Matplotlib. Surprise! So, but maybe first we just look at our requirements. So what would we like from a good uh, Jupyter charting library? So number one on my list is the ergonomic API. So how quickly can I build the chart that I need? So I don't have an eternity to spend on a, on a charting API if it's put together in an ergonomic fashion. I can usually, using my, my IDE or using the, the Jupyter Lab directly, I can very quickly find what I need and I can very quickly put together the chart that I need. Also very importantly is good integration with NumPy and or Pandas. So in, in these data science uh, notebooks, uh, we use Pandas and NumPy uh, quite extensively. And if there's a good link between these data abstractions and the charting library, that also saves us time. Another thing that has become more important recently is interaction in Jupyter Lab. So uh, can I use this charting library with, for example, IPy widgets? In other words, can I link sliders and all kinds of interactive controls so that I can, that I can uh, interact with my data and my visualizations and therefore sort of build up a better uh, convergent understanding of the data? Um, and does it support things like linked brushing? So I can have multiple charts in the same data and then select in one of the charts and see how that selection is automatically reflected in the other chart. And then finally, um, does it support uh, presentation quality output. So can I, after I've had this interactive session, uh, when I want to build a presentation or when I want to build a high quality document, can this generate high quality uh, images for me? Quite important. So why uh, can't we just use Matplotlib? So Matplotlib is the oldest and the most entrenched of all of these libraries. It's battle tested as Jake van der Plas also calls it in his talk, but it's unfortunately, well, or fortunately, uh, depends on the timing actually, modeled after the MATLAB API, and it was designed before the web took over the world. Um, and this is quite visible when you use this uh, in Jupyter. So with some effort, uh, well, actually with no effort, you can get non-interactive inline plots in your notebooks. With a little bit of effort, you can make them interactive. But this has always seemed sort of bolted on. It's never been a first-class citizen, it feels like, in the Mat, uh, Matplotlib world. That's also why I went looking for alternatives. Although I do think it's good to at least know how Matplotlib works and to have a, a sort of a basic grasp of its API, uh, which has been called by many people not the most ergonomic. And I think once again, that's probably due to its MATLAB, uh, MATLAB heritage. Okay, so let's get uh, let's get to the to the actual meat of this uh, of this lecture. Uh, the two libraries or two toolkits, which I think are currently the best choices in the data science Jupyter context, and this is in no, no specific order, or at least we'll get uh, 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 at a later point in this lecture, we'll get to which, when you should use a which, or whether you should even make a choice between the two. So Bokeh is the, is the first candidate I would like to focus on, and that's a Python library designed by uh, Continuum IO. This is these are the same people behind the whole Anaconda ecosystem. So the, this is these are the kind of the Python libraries and the environments that we use. It is a modern uh, easy API, uh, loosely based on the grammar of graphics, which is quite which is quite an important thing in the visualization world. Um, it has first class support for interaction in Jupyter notebooks and Jupyter Lab. It can export either bitmaps or SVG 
uh, vector graphics, which are really nice for high quality presentation graphics. And just uh, quite interestingly, because this will become relevant with the, the second candidate I will mention, is that uh, the, bo the bokeh Python code, it generates a JSON-based description of the, of the chart, and that's then sent to bo uh, bokeh.js on the front end, which goes and renders that in, a, in an interactive fashion. So this is what the code looks like. Um, it's actually quite impressive. This code defines two side-by-side -side plots with linked interaction, which I can hopefully show, uh, show you right now. So there's the code. And if I run that in my notebook, then I get these two sample plots over here. And now I should be able to select in any one of them and then see the selection automatically reflected in the other. And this happens very cleanly with the share data source abstraction. So I set up uh, a, bokeh, a bokeh column data source where I have a single X and then two Y's. And then my left plot uses the X and the Y zero and my right plot the X and the Y one. And because that source is the same, these selections are also the same. So that's pretty elegant. And I actually think this is quite, uh, this is not, not very much code for uh, this much interactive uh, interaction. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So there's that. Uh, more information on Bokeh. Uh, I'm working on more mini lectures to introduce you to its use and to dig into some of the features. Um, there will be also links in the, in the lecture notes to a, a whole list of example notebooks that can get you started and also the reference guide. So the next candidate is Altair. Altair is a Python front end by Jake van der Plas, and this is also what he um, talks about in his presentation. Um, it's a front end to the Vega and Vega Lite visualization grammars, which I think definitely form an important part of the future of this sort of visualization. So Vega is, it's actually a domain specific language for the description of visualizations. They've chosen JSON as, as at least the implementation of this language, but uh, you, on top of JSON or in JSON, you specify the interaction, you specify all of the marks and you specify the encodings. And then uh, there are Vega compilers, which will then take that specification and generate beautiful uh, interactive visualizations. So Altair is an almost straight mapping of Vega onto Python. So you code it in Python, but secretly or not so secretly behind the scenes, that Python code is generating a Vega spec and then sending that Vega spec to the Vega front end, which goes and compiles it into a, into a D3 visualization. This is a really elegant API. It's now on uh, version four, I believe. Um, and you can see that a whole bunch of thought has gone into making, uh, uh, you know, uh, really optimizing this API. It has great pandas integration. So you, in essence, just pass a data frame directly to the chart abstraction and then continue with your mark and your, your encoding specification. And that's it. So you can go directly from a pandas data frame to a plot. Okay. What's quite interesting here is that the, the, the Altair API is determined by Vega, and that's a double-edged sword. What I mean by that is, on the one hand, Vega is really well thought out, and it's a, it's it's just theoretically founded uh, implementation. Um, but uh, that does mean that we we lose some freedom on the Python side. So where Bokeh has been designed and it's been evolved to be practical and very pragmatic, it can sometimes happen that because Vega lives in a different domain, not the Python domain, it can happen that Altair uh, you know, will be limited to these choices. And this might limit you also in uh, what you're able to do. Um, I, you know, experience will, uh, will have to show what exactly the, the impact is of, uh, of this. Here's this, uh, an example actually of the, of the same, well, more or less the same idea. I took this from the, from the Altair uh, documentation. We can take an interactive look at that. So over here, it's again, very, very little code for a lot of visualization. So what we have here is uh, a Pandas data frame, and then uh, we create a brush, and we'll see what that is right now. That is the, the well, the link selection. And here we go in, uh, let's say, with this, this kind of Python mapping of, of the Vega spec. So I create a chart, and in that I bind the, the data frame. Then I say, well, I'm gonna use a bunch of point marks and then I describe how different um, elements of that data will be encoded onto visual channels on those charts. So it says basically that the Y uh, position of each point comes from miles per gallon, um, at least in the one case, this first case. 
over here and it also says that the, the color uh, will be affected by the brush by the selection as you see how that works um, that's actually the base encoding this, this is very elegant so you build up this uh, this base chart and then you continue and you say well on the left so I've already I've already said I want to uh, encode y uh, the y position as you know I want to encode miles per gallon as the y position and I've set up my brush and I that means I'm sharing a brush for you know in this base uh, base chart and then finally I say well take that base chart and on the one hand the left side encode x with horsepower over here you can see it down there and on the right side encode x or encode uh, um, acceleration as the x position and you or that and there you go you have two link plots that's 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 pretty elegant so you can see over here if i select anything here i'll see that selection reflected on the left side and it's bi-directional so that's really really elegant the other uh, very nice thing is i can now go and i can say um, open in the vega editor and then it'll tr transfer me to the online vega editor and here i have the full specification of that chart including the data and i can go and live edit and see what the results over here will be okay so that's Altair super super elegant you can see why I say I think this is going to play an important role in the future of uh, of Python charting and charting and visualization in general right so more resources I'm working on on again mini lectures uh, introducing you to Altair and digging into some of the details uh, in the lecture notes where you know this will end up on the website uh, you'll, there will be links to the documentation and obviously also the example gallery. So that brings us to the final question and the conclusion of this lecture. Which of the two should I use? As always, the answer is not that simple. It's both. So it depends. So um, personally, I use, and this is also what I, what I recommend, I use um, Altair wherever uh, Altair has a specific plot or the specific construct that I require in which case as you have seen just now it's super elegant um, and you have very very high expressivity you can put together your plot or your interaction really quickly and really really elegantly um, and as a bonus you get a Vega or a Vega light specification which you can eventually easily embed in a dashboard on a, on a, in a real web app that uh, that has you know that that is in production when you require a little bit more flexibility then maybe it's time to get out the, bo the bouquet. So I think both of these are definitely worth your time. It's definitely worth looking at least at both of them and coming up with your own strategy. As I said, mine is I use both and it depends on the situation. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope to see you soon.